Open digital asset news, take the top stories in cryptocurrency digital assets, and break them down to bite-sized pieces. Today, we've got some pretty bullish news, and it really doesn't come from any type of article or any type of little piece that we had picked up, but this is actually from the Pompliano podcast, where he is interviewing MicroStrategy CEO Michael Saylor, and the things that he says about why his company invested near a half a billion dollars into Bitcoin when just so many years ago he was talking about Bitcoin was going to die was just, it just blew my mind and it made me realize just how lucky we are to be here right now. And what he talks about when he says there's gonna be something happening in two, three, and four months really made me pay attention. So I'm gonna break down this entire hour and a half interview into five parts that we're gonna condense into six minutes. Also, great news if you have ever used Uniswap before today, because they're gonna give you 400 tokens, which when I was making this video started out around 250, and when I ended the video, it start, it was about $3.52. So we'll go over both of those things, but first let's talk a look at the market. So today it is Thursday, September 17th, almost high noon Texas time, and it looks like Bitcoin is hitting up a little bit of a stride, but still down one and a half percent. It was above 11,000 yesterday, but we just uh, took a little tumble, but hey, I'll take 10.8, no problem. It's up it's up 6% for seven day, happy with that. Ethereum, 380, I'm waiting for the 400. I think it can hit it, I think it can do it. Tether's Tether, nobody cares. XRP, hey, up 2%, 2, 3%, 25 cents, wow. Polkadot, up 6%, 533, I'll take that. Bitcoin Cash in that sixth spot, again, potentially going, well, it'll go for their hard fork in uh, November. Also, Chainlink down 1.8, it might fall below that $10 mark, we will see. Binance coin, oh, how far we've fallen. 6%, although up 7%, and they dipped their toes in the DeFi space. Isn't working out too, for them too much. Crypto.com down 2.6%, again, doing the same thing. Didn't really work out so hot. Cardano up 2.4, that's pretty nice. What's up? 5% uh, for Tron. Congratulations, Tron holders. I don't hold any anymore, but uh, if you, you held it, congratulations. Neo, same thing, don't hold any more. Cosmos, I hear good things about this project and interoperability. You need to take a look at that a little bit harder. You're in finance down at 32. What are you going to do? D chain up 8%, uh, almost at 2 cents. Wow. Uh, UMA, UMA down 6. Another uh, project for DeFi. Also, Ave down a little bit. Zcash, Ontology, Synthetics also down. Seems like the DeFi space down a little bit, but uh, that's how it is. Theta, my new, uh, not my new hold, but I've been holding this for a while. I'm Really bullish on this one. I think it's going to do great. Again, this is good news. It's up 1.7%. I think this project will do well. Uh, it's got um, an advisor. One of the advisors is the uh, ex YouTube founders, and they're doing a lot of good things. And they're actually have a working project right now. And I'm going to be doing live streams over at Theta. Kusama, I've heard about this project up 14%. Need to take a look at that. That one looks pretty good. Dogecoin. <laughs> Down one and a half percent. Digibyte. Ooh, we're going down deep today. QDM waves. And then this little guy right here. Over the last hour, it is up 13%. When I was looking at this this morning, it was like 250. Now it's at 381. It's up 13%. Over 24 hours, 117%. So yeah, not too shabby. And everything's looking pretty good. Also, ooh, one of my favorites. My one-two punch Celsius up 2%, 34% for seven days, wow, 57 cents. Boy, I wish I could buy more of that, but I live in Texas, so that sucks. Anyhow, let's jump into today's top story. So next up, continuing on with my bromance of Anthony Pompliano here, I gotta tell you, this guy, smart guy, has some really fantastic guests. If you didn't watch the video that we did with Jim Cramer, uh, I broke it down. It was an hour and seven minute long podcast. We broke it down into five snippets and it was just the crux of the information. This one was even longer. So first of all, if you haven't seen our video on MicroStrategy, we've been covering this for the last week to two weeks. MicroStrategy is a, a billion dollar company it's uh, data analytics, and it's run there by Michael Saylor, the CEO. And what they are doing is they bought darn near half a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin. And it kind of shook everybody because the first time it was 250 million, and then just, they, they came about and then they bought another 170 plus million dollars worth of Bitcoin. And the question I have was why? Why now? Why after all this time? What's going on? Why did this company buy all this Bitcoin right now? And the question I have was, did they use their analytics advantage to just crunch a bunch of data and go, this is the best thing to do? Or was it some other information or piece that they had behind the scenes? And and actually, I, I after listening to this, this uh, podcast, it comes down to a bit of both pieces of information. So we're going to break this down into five parts because the first, you can watch the whole thing. I'll link in the description. 
Uh, Mr. Saylor here, love to talk about himself, which is fine. <laughs> He's a super smart guy. He is a, uh, he worked for DuPont. He had a scholarship at uh, MIT. He was in the Air Force. So he's a fellow veteran. He started up his company at 24 years old. He pretty much badgered DuPont to give him a quarter of a million dollars back in the 80s so he could start up his own company, which is insane, but here we are. And he has taken that company at 24 years old to a million dollars, $30 million, then all the way here we are at a billion dollar company. And what he talks about here is just what is going on, not just inside the company, but inside other companies and at a macro level about what's gonna happen. And after I listened to this, I thought to myself, man, I mean, I invest in Bitcoin pretty heavily and I thought I should probably be investing a little more. And it really comes down to what he talks about in the very first part here, which is asset inflation versus monetary inflation. It makes a ton of sense when he, when he says it. So let's just take a listen. And the economy, when to the worst price I've seen in 30 years, at that point, you start having a thought with yourself, which is, what is, what is the true inflation rate? And, and we should probably coin a different term, right? If you, if you looked at asset inflation on a good year for the last decade, it's 7% a year normal, right? This year, you could make an argument it was 25%. I mean, if you look at the long bond index and if you look at these equities, you can make an argument that the asset inflation rate leaped between 25 and 30 percent, depending. And uh, and now, what does that mean to me metaphorically? Well, here's how I feel. I felt like I had $500 million of cash in the bank, safe, and it was yielding 2 3 percent, and I'm ready for a rainy day, and then I'm starting to do stuff with it. And then every month, some banker sends me a note saying the interest went down. It went down. Now there is no interest. And then someone took my cash out of the bank and they put it in the backyard in pallets. And then they opened my back gate. And then every month, someone comes along and starts burning 2% of the money. And then I started thinking, well, you know, in 12 months, 25% of the money is going to be gone. And then, you know, then I started thinking, what is the point of all this? What, what am I doing wrong? And of course, the answer is you can't hold cash. And so you can't hold cash. And it's one of those things where I have always talked about how cash is king. And when I listen to this, I'm like, that's very true. I mean, it's very true. Assets are, I mean, the inflation rate is huge. And he talks about bonds and equities, but just take a look at the at the housing market right now. If you go out there and try to buy a house, for some reason, even though the economy's in the toilet and people losing their jobs left and right and 60% of small businesses are gonna go under and not reopen, uh, houses are going through the roof. And that's just not in America. I verified this in places for uh, subscribers in Europe, also Canada. And um, it's just a very odd thing. So when he talks about, hey, I shouldn't be uh, have my money into, or my, my money in money, uh, that's a very good point, especially with all the assets. So what it all comes down to is you need a product that is a hedge. So next up, he's going to get into uh, COVID or the coronavirus and how it didn't just change the perception of the day-to-day -day operation of a business and what the actual outcome should be, but it's really about how it, it changes the perception for everything, including Bitcoin. And this was the most fascinating to me because my question was, how did you get, how did you arrive to put in half a billion dollars almost into Bitcoin? Now the corporate standard, everyone will switch over to Zoom starting tomorrow, right? That's how, and by the way, the same CEO that said, I don't believe in remote work. You got to show up to the office or else you're not working for me. And I would have sworn up and down. I hated remote work until COVID crisis hit. Flip. And so that, that same idea happened with the balance sheet. There are all these strongly held views. You got to be conservative. You got to invest in cash and short term T bills. And you don't contemplate anything else. And then all of a sudden, you contemplate other things. So I mean, you're an expert. You tell me if you had $500 million of cash right now, where would you invest it? Uh, I'm cheating because you and I see eye to eye now as I'd go buy a lot of Bitcoin. And of course, yeah, Palm's going to say that. That's just how it is. That's Well, that's exactly how I think we would all kind of come to that conclusion. But really, if you start to think about it, this guy, Michael Saylor, part of a billion dollar company, CEO, if he came to this conclusion and he's talking about all these things or how much time do you think it's going to take before other CEOs, CFOs, 
are going to come up and go, you know what? Uh, we are just burning cash and we can't have this here. We could, we need to get in some type of assets, some type of hedge assets that we can really get into. And uh, well, let's see, MicroStrategy did something like that and uh, they're doing pretty good so far. How much time do you think it is before all these companies start to pile in? It's already starting. It's already starting. You got the Jim Cramers, you got the Paul Tudor Jones, you got the Michael Saylors, you got the TD Ameritrades, you got the Fidelity Digital Assets. I mean, the tide is coming and I think it's gonna come faster than what we think it is. So the next part here is, this was a question that I got in the comment section, which was all these businesses are buying all this Bitcoin, but it's like the price hasn't moved that much. So what the heck is going on? Well, Sailor here is going to open up the curtain and kind of reveal how he bought, not him, but him and his team, bought so much Bitcoin and didn't really move the price at all, which to me was really eye-opening. We wrapped it all. So substantially 95% of that money is either invested in our stock or in Bitcoin. And we've accomplished that in short order, right? Like over the course of six weeks, or four weeks. Now, uh, regarding acquiring that much Bitcoin, first of all, I can't give you like exact blow by blow details because I've got security issues and the world is watching and I, I can't. But what I can do is, 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 I can describe to you, if you were running a company, how you should think about this. You know, if you were in my position, which is you're going to go and you're aud you're going to audition a bunch of uh, a bunch of uh, institutional grade exchanges. You're going to work through and look for institutional grade custodians. You're, you're going to look at. Uh, you know, all, all of the security issues, all the technology issues, et cetera, you're going you're gonna to think about the team. You're going to build a relationship with them. And then you're going to buy, if you're going to buy that much, you're going to buy it in thousands or tens of thousands or 100,000 plus small transactions day and night, minute by minute, over the like over the course of many 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 days, so so um, it's not like we're going in. I, I, I'll sit and I'll watch this happening, and I've got a great team, you know, a great team that I've worked with, and some excellent professionals. They are brilliant geniuses at what they do, but let me tell you, they've got great technology too, right? It's like, and, and you got to have the right technology, you got to have the right team, and then you have to be very patient, like very very patient you know like a, I'll, I'll watch people walk in on monday morning and you know i was like okay some dude just got up at 9 a.m and decided to buy some bitcoin and the price spikes you know whenever i see that i'm like well that guy won't be in the market very long because no one that really wanted to buy a lot of bitcoin would be so silly as to spike the price so hard you know i i can tell you this which is we bought $425 million worth of it and we never ran the price. Not a dollar. Like, you don't know. Impressive. Yeah, right? it's pretty because impressive. If I'm in the market, you wouldn't know that I'm trading against you ever because that's just, that's not how you get stuff done, right? Let the market come to you. So there's a couple of things to unpack there. Uh, first of all, when he talks about how he didn't run up the price and he didn't see how why people would do that there's people out there there are whales and they love volatility so you know what they can do is they can buy a ton and then the price will skyrocket and then they'll sell off and then it'll go back down again they'll buy for cheap i mean that's just that's just how those guys work but in here in, in his situation what he's thinking of i believe is that hey i want to hold this for the long haul and he talks about holding bitcoin for like 100 years so uh, this gentleman here is all in and his business. So there is that part. And the second part is, is that he had to take, uh, I think he said it was like between three and six months. I forgot which, uh, how much it, it actually took or six weeks, but he did a lot, him and his team did a lot of work and they have to be super patient uh, just to get the Bitcoin to where they wouldn't move the price, you know, at all, or just a little bit. So that's just one company. That's just $1 billion company. Now just start to extrapolate that out. How many other companies, big businesses, conglomerates are going to get into this space and try to do exactly what MicroStrategy did. They're not going to be able to do it 
at a, for a very long amount of time. There's only so much Bitcoin out there. The price will go up. It's just that these guys were very slick and they got in early. So when people ask me, well, well, how, why does it not, you know, move up? Well, there has to come a point when you are buying so many Bitcoin. There's only like 18 and a half million out there. When you're buying so much that eventually the price is going to rise and is going to go crazy. And it just takes a small fluctuation. And that's not that much. $500, $1,000 increase, which I mean, percentage wise is pretty big. But uh, if you have all these players and they're all trying to do the same thing, which is not move the price and one screws up and it only takes one screw up where they're like, oh, shoot, we bought way too much. And then the price goes up a little bit. And then some retail investors go, hey, the price is going up and they start to buy. And other companies like, wait, 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 these companies are buying too much. We got to get in there now. And then all of a sudden, to the moon. So that's what I think will happen. Just that, uh, you know, hats off to Michael Saylor and his team. Those guys are just slick enough to do it without anybody knowing about it. Okay, next up, I am hoping that Peter Schiff is listening to my channel. Peter, hello. This is where he talks about Bitcoin is a hundred to maybe even a thousand times better than gold. And when businesses all figure it out, it's going to take them a very short amount of time to actually get their positions. And we're going to see some fireworks. And he lets something slip. And I'm going to I hope you can pick it up when he says, listen, I just want you to listen to this, maybe two, three, four months. Just listen for that in this little snippet. Inflation hedge. This is, this is, if it's, it's not 10 X better than gold, it's a hundred X. Maybe it's a thousand X better than gold. We could go on for hours. I could tell you why I think it's a thousand X better than gold, but let's just assume since we're preaching to the choir that it's a thousand X better than gold. Once you realize that it's a thousand X better than gold, from that point, it's minimum 12 weeks if you went like a bat out of hell and probably six months. And I kind of feel that if people were waiting to see if this was possible, well, they kind of saw our announcement August. So the six month clock starts in August. If, if they were uh, super if they were just perfectly configured, if they had all the same characteristics as us, then they start focusing on this in May or June. Nobody's thinking about this in March or April. I was just so busy trying to keep the doors open and, and their bells getting rung. So take August and say August, September, October, I, you know, December, January, February. I think that what you're going to see is over the next two, three, four months, something interesting and um you know I, the the other point right that's not not lost upon me is there's 3500 publicly traded companies there's five trillion dollars in their treasuries and it's all melting and and yeah at some point you have a fiduciary obligation to not lose the money okay you know like it, it's it, it used to, it used to be acceptable to be conservative, but that was before the asset inflation rate went from 6% to 30%. And there he said it. There's a bunch of different companies and they have $5 trillion in their treasury and it's on fire. What do you think they're going to do once they hear this story about MicroStrategy and how they not only save the cash, but they actually grew their position with this type of asset, which is also the best performing asset over the last decade. I don't know what uh, what you think, but uh, I got my opinion. Okay, and lastly, I just want to throw this in because he talks about volatility, and he talks about how it's not so much that there, it's actually volatile out there, but people like him and his companies are going to dampen that volatility, of course, when it skyrockets. And then he talks about how crypto is just fantastic, and again, how gold is far inferior. So Peter, pay attention that you could have chosen um and when we talk about volatility it's not like hey it may go up to two percent or down two percent you can have double digit percentage days uh, up or down um does that change your strategy is this just your long-term holding it for you know years and years kind of how, how do you think about that <clears throat> well so first of all i think the volatility is falling and i i, I think all you gotta do is look at the chart and I, there's a narrative like everybody's like everybody wants to say that they know something about crypto wants to jump up and say, well, you know, it's volatile. Well, well, it was volatile in 2017, you know, when like individuals were trading it on their mobile phone. But yeah, think about what I just what I just said about how we acquired it. We buy one hundred and seventy five million dollars. 
I'm in the market every minute of the day for multiple days in a row. I'm damping the volatility. One person like me, right? In every, every trading day that I'm in the market, I'm damping it to the upside and the downside, and I'm damping it with large sums of money, right? And, and so how many, of, how many institutions does it take before they damp it, right? Like, I'm the, I'm the dude, I'm like, okay, well, I'll pay an extra whatever, but stop this thing. I'm holding it for 100 freaking years, right? It's like, I'm not really, I'm not the day trader guy that's worried about it. So I think that as the institutions come in and as they buy bigger amounts, they're damping the volatility. That's my first observation. My second observation is crypto trades 168 hours a week. Every other asset trades 35 hours a week at best and sometimes less on holidays, right? You're trading. I look at this thing in awe. You know, when I look at these exchanges, Saturday night, 9.30 p.m., and I'm watching the thing stream and I'm like, this is the most magical, hardest working security in the history of the world. And, and I would think everybody ought to be in awe that the thing's not going haywire. It's remarkably non-volatile in that regard. Like, in my opinion, you could, go and, you could go into the market and you could liquidate 50 or $100 million worth of this stuff in a matter of an hour any hour of the day, any day of the week on a holiday, and maybe you take a 3% haircut. But go try to liquidate $100 million of gold on a Saturday afternoon in Istanbul on the street side. And that's just it. So that is it for that little segment. I will just say this. When he said, he said, look, I'm not the day trader that has to worry about it. And, uh, you know, I'm just going to be here for 100 years. That's pretty much how I am and what I've been talking about since I began this channel. Uh, when I first got into this this market, it was all about you need a day trade, you need a day trade, and you can do that all you want to, that's fine. But for me personally, and um, maybe for you, it's just about dollar cost averaging, putting the money in, and then off you go. Um, I don't believe that Bitcoin will go to zero. I think that is a ridiculous statement. And I know that we will go up and down, we will have our turbulence points, but, just looking at what it was in 2017, where it was just pretty much hope and white papers. And now what we have today and what, the, I mean, the type of participation that we have from, I mean, big, big, big players and big people and uh, the track has been laid and everything that's going on. I just don't see how this doesn't take off. That's all I have to say. So let me know what you think in the comment section. Let's move on to our next piece. All right, so getting into one of the big stories, introducing Uni. And this was from yesterday, probably late at night, I'm not for sure, but I just saw this today, and this was actually put out to me from Sergeant Crypto and also Crazy for Cryptos. He had actually put that out. So both of these guys, uh, thank you so much for the heads up. So what exactly is going on here? So first of up, uh, Uniswap, the token, the governance token, just got listed on CoinGecko. And if we take a look, we talked about before, so this is in the number 70 position and we can see in the last 24 hours it's gone up 64 percent whatever that means because i think it was just listed so sure uh over seven days of course hasn't been out seven days so we don't know but uh it's already at two dollars and 89 cents which is gonna be important to us in a little bit so this is coming right from uniswap.org forward slash blog i'll list this in the description below and this is what's happening. So 60% of the Uniswap Genesis supply is allocated to Uniswap community members, a quarter of which, 15% of total supply, has already been distributed to past users. So essentially what's going on here is that if you've ever used Uniswap before the 16th, you're going to get free tokens, which is always nice. So it's, it does pay to be a little bit early, and uh, this is how we're going to do it. So let's go through the article first, just to make sure we know exactly what's going on. So to start, Uni is available through four liquidity mining pools. Uni holders may vote to add more pools after an initial 30-day governance grace period, which starts today. So this is what they're all talking about. Uh, they have been, as they put it, inspired by Ethereum's vision. They have long committed to the ideals of permissionless access, security, and immutability, all indispensable components for a future where anyone in the world can access financial services without fear 
of discrimination or counterparty risk. And I think that they are actually living up to this credo uh, a little bit more than what SushiSwap did. That's for darn sure. Now it states here, rivaling centralized incumbents on daily volume. And a couple of days ago, we actually had talked about this, how they had overtaken Coinbase and other large exchanges to be one of the biggest exchanges, whether that be centralized or decentralized, out there at present. And this is what they've been doing over the past two years. They've supported over 20 billion volume. They've secured over 1 billion liquidity, deposited over 49,000 unique liquidity providers or LPs, earning 56 million fees in the process and emerges as a foundational DeFi infrastructure. So these guys have really come out of nowhere. I mean, they've probably been doing this for a long time. It's just that, uh, you know how it goes. It's a, it's an overnight success that took a long time. And here we are, uh, in the forefront of DeFi. So this is how it's all going to work. Uni allocation. So 60% is going to the Uniswap community members or 600 million Uni. And this is exactly how you're supposed to do it. So you create something, you have a uh, you have mining for or the, uh, the Genesis block, and you go, you know what? 60% is going out to the community members, which is where it should go. So think about a lot of other projects that you can think of right now where they mined it and guess where it went to? It went to the founders, it went to some investors, it went to a very small portion, which makes it, in my opinion, centralized. So if they're going to say, hey, we're going to mine all this and 60% uh, goes out, so we don't have control of it, thanks so much. That's kind of like the whole idea behind decentralization, and I can support that for sure. 21% are going to team members and future employees with four-year vesting. Hey, I'm okay with that. If you're giving away a ton of it, 60%, and then 21% goes to uh, members and people who are actually going to uh, you know, keep the whole project going and flowing, fine, fantastic. 70% to investors with four-year vesting and 0 0.069 to advisors with four-year vesting. So they are actually putting money into it. I'm good with that. This is interesting. A perpetual inflation rate of 2% per year will start after four years. This is ensuring continued participation and contribution to Uniswap at the expense of passive unit holders. So you can't just sit back and not do anything. You got to be involved in the community. That's great. Moving down, a retrospective. Uniswap owes its success to the thousands of community members that have joined its journey over the past two years, people like you and me. These early community members will naturally serve as responsible stewards of Uniswap. 49 million uni are claimable by historical liquidity providers. So it all looks good. Let's see, there's going to be liquidity mining. An initial liquidity mining program will go live September 18th. So we're looking at, when is that, tomorrow? Uh, the initial program will run until November 17th and target the following four pools on Uniswap V2. ETH USDT, ETH USDC, ETH DAI, ETH Wrap Bitcoin. 5 million uni will be allocated per pool to LPs, which roughly translates to 83,000 plus per pool per day, or 55 uni per pool per block. So in the meantime, uni holders, uh, in, until this actually happens, will have immediate ownership of the governance token, uni community treasury, which is big, Pay attention to Sushi Swap, the protocol fee switch, Uniswap default list, and the SOX liquidity token. So here's the next step. All historical users, liquidity priors, and SOX redeemers can claim their uni now. So uh, just to make sure uh, to get the right web address, I have this on my exchange and wallet fees. Uh, this is in the description of every one of my videos. There's a link that looks just like this. And this goes over every wallet and exchange and, de and decentralized exchange that I use and recommend. And I also break down all the different fees and things like that. Uh, you can use the affiliate links or not. Um, you can go right to it. If you don't want to use it, that's fine. But if you use the links, they give you $10, $25 just to sign up. And as you know, I recommend to sign up to as many as possible, especially when a parabolic bull run comes. So you're not left out like a lot of people were in 2017. So over here, as we go forward, Binance, Uphold, Abra, Simple Swap, Uniswap. So here is the actual website address. We're going to click on that. So when you first come here, there's nothing really magical. It's not going to be able to just go, here's your tokens. You have to connect to a wallet. And this has got a wallet that you have used in the past for Uniswap. So they can actually verify that you have used this in the past. So we're going to click on a connect to wallet. And for me, I used MetaMask before. It was pretty simple. It was uh, connected to my Brave browser. And you can't get any more uh, easier than that. That's I love Brave because they make it so simple and you get to earn that token uh, just for surfing around the uh, internet. So I'm going to click on that. 
And then this little guy is going to come up. Hey, look at that. 400 uni. Uni has arrived. Thanks for being part of the Uniswap community. Claim uni tokens. Sure, I will do that. So again, you can read more about uni. And that was the same article that we just went over. I'm going to claim uni. So of course, for here, there's always a gas fee. And unfortunately, right now, it is quite high. However, uh, to get 400 uni at uh, almost $3, yeah, sure, I'm going to confirm that. So right now it's pending, it's going through the whole process. And then as I come back, uh, it's been about uh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes or so. Uh, it looks like the balance was claimed of 400, unclaimed 0.00. Wow, uni price already up to 387. So not a bad day, uh, just do a little bit of work. Uh, I will take it. So there we are. Now what we need to do is make sure that it's actually in our wallet. So let's take a look at whatever wallet that you have. For me, it's in my Brave browser, it's my MetaMask. So I'm gonna take a look at my wallet to see if it's actually there. But you can see right here, um, the wallet address is pasted right here. That's the one that is, is connected to. So it should be the same one, let's open it up. So what I'm gonna do in Brave is open up a new, t uh, new tab. Click on the Brave icon, the upper left-hand corner, which you can't see. Go to Preferences, and you can't see that. But uh, there is all my information right there. And on the very right-hand side, it says Crypto Wallets. I'm gonna open that guy up. And let's see what we got. Let me turn this down. And there it is, 400 uni at 1529. So uh, just to be aware of this is that um, just give it some time. And it may look like things aren't working too well in the beginning, but just give a little bit of time. Because remember, this is all through you know um, Ethereum and the transaction fees are high and it just takes a long time. So uh, the more you wait, probably the more the fees are going to jump up and uh, who knows if you know you know there is enough to go around so if my recommendation is definitely do this as soon as possible and get this done so you can have your uni right there and then you can uh, save it spend it whatever you want to do all right so that's it for today so i hope that last piece helped you out with the uniswap platform and i gotta tell you i gotta tell you uh, that is one of those ways of how you build a community. Uh, you don't pull some type of, you know, uh, master chef sushi swap thing where you know the money's just out there. Uh, you just you set it all up in the beginning and say, hey, this is what we're gonna do. This is how we're gonna do things, and you lay it all out very clearly. I was on a show yesterday. It was uh, with uh, BN Crypto. It was, Crypt it was me, Crypto Love, and Hashoshi. And Hashoshi, um, he said it very clearly. He said, you know. The whole sushi swap situation could have been prevented if the master chef just would have laid it all out and said, hey, I'm going to take X amount of dollars because that is going to be my salary and that's what I need to actually live on. But I'm going to do all the things that I promised to do and just you know, send it out as, as a tweet or on any kind of social media, on Telegram. And he said it would have been no big deal because people would have understood. Now, uh, there's a big difference between taking like 200,000 for a salary as opposed to, you know, 12, 13 million or whatever else it was. But I would say that the way that they did this as far as Uniswap did, it was a fantastic way. Like, look, we're going to give 60% to the community. We're not going to hoard it. We're not going to just give it to the founders and just let, you know, some whales buy it all up. So there's 96% in a very concentrated uh, uh, little piece of, of the pie we are going to give it all out there and let it for the community and that to me is the whole point of decentralization let me know what you think but that's just how i see it and then the next one or in the actually the very beginning when we talked uh, about the uh, pompliano podcast uh with mr sailor there which who was the uh, ceo of uh, microstrategy um again it's a fantastic thing it's a, just a great look as to how businesses are actually seeing bitcoin cryptocurrency and digital assets and if you have uh, that person and that huge billion dollar company making strides what do you think is going to happen when all the other companies who are just sitting back and our spectators going i wonder how it's all going to work out and then it does work out and then all of a sudden they're like hmm all those trillions of dollars they have in their treasury like we talked about maybe we should do something with that maybe we should get into a deflationary asset that is not quantitative easing but it's quantitative hardening. So uh, that is it for today. Uh, if you would be so kind, um, make sure you check out um, uh, Anthony Pompliano's podcast. He's got a YouTube show. It's fantastic. I highly recommend it. I'll put it. I'll put it at the very end, uh, so you can click and check out the whole thing. Again, it's an hour and a half, so uh, just be ready to you know listen to the whole stuff. And it's a lot about uh, Sailor there talking about himself, which is fine. And, uh, and that is it for today. So thanks so much for watching all the way to the end. I really appreciate it. There's no Q of the day uh, section. We went through a lot of stuff. Um, but if you like those types of videos, I'm going to put two more at the very top. You can check those out. And that is it. So thanks so much for watching to the very end. And I'll see you on the next one.